call the Elk Creek Fire Protection Board of Directors meeting to occur on February 9th at 6 o'clock. We have uh, Director Pixley is on the Zoom, so I will assume the chair role in the room here today. Um, so, call us to order. Can I ask uh, Director Baker to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And confirm there he is. Greg Pixley is on the Zoom. All the rest of the board members are here. So we will all call us in as present. Uh, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, yes, there, there is one under new business. It will be the uh, surplusing of old SCBA. Okay. S C S C B A. C -B -A. Got it. Uh, any other additions and exclusions? With that, I'll seek a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Director Paisley. <laughs> um, let's uh, review. Take a couple minutes to review the minutes if you haven't had a chance to do so already. And then I would take a motion to approve the minutes from the January meeting. Make a motion to approve the minutes for the January 2023 Board of Directors meeting. Great. Any other corrections to this? Second. Second. Any discussion? No. Okay. So move the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Director Woods, it's oh. your... We're doing financial stuff. So, Chief. Yeah. Oh, you do. Actually, he's got... Oh, you have it. Got some efficiencies here. Efficiency is great. Tell you know, me. he knows how to work. Huh. I'm going to move out of the way so that people can see it. So that I can see it. Also, just go to the next slide. Then. It'll be fine. First thing I'll we'll talk about is year-to-date revenue. We've only had one month of 2023, so there's not much to like really talk about. The total revenue forecast for the year is the number that's up there, 5,387,681. Pretty close to flat from 2022. So that means that um, property taxes should be flat, right? <laughs> The ones we pay should be flat. Um, the actual total revenue for January was 103,545 versus the forecast of 24,000. This line is different from the last time I presented the year to date total revenue overview because what I did was instead of making it a linear, um, growing, if you will, I actually forecasted it how it should. So it, it should be more indicative of what revenue is coming in and how it comes in. So that'll hopefully be an improvement. Um, significant contributions to the revenue number of property taxes are only 3,494. We had a large donation, $10,000 from the Gary Magnus Family Foundation. Are you going to talk about that? No. Um. Yeah, I can I, I yeah, can touch on mind that. Kind of filling in on that because I don't know much about it. Uh, so, so the Mag is anybody familiar with the Magnus Ranch? Um, it's a uh, large land holding down the end of uh, Mount Evans Boulevard. If anybody goes to the end of Mount Evans Boulevard, you see Hidden Valley Ranch. That's that's the Magnus Ranch, hmm. and uh, they have been pretty benevolent with fire protection districts with Black yeah. Canyon and us over the last couple of years, um, and. They kind of change ranch managers, and they're super nice people to work with. And so they called us and said they wanted to donate some money. And we some? said thank you. <laughs> some? 
I'd say that's a pretty sizable community. It's, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, we were honest, awesome. honestly, Captain Yellen and I went there, and I wasn't really sure what we were expecting because they didn't tell us. And he said, the ranch manager just pulled it out the pocket. He's like, oh, here you guys go. Yeah, you want a tour? Didn't look at it. We got the truck, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was Whoa. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very generous of them. What was your amount? 10000 10000 yeah. Um, ownership taxes continue to be a little higher than expected. We got a $20,000 grant for PPE, I believe. Correct. That was the grant we were awarded last year, but it paid this but year. Paid this year, right. Well, we can't record until it's paid. Yeah. We can hope, but we can't record. Okay. Um, we actually had 26000 in ambulance fillings and interest because of rising interest rates continue. Thank you, the Fed. Um, we actually had 20000 in interest for the month in our Colorado Trust account. Next slide. Okay, year to date expenses. Same thing. I sort of did this more instead of just doing, you know, one twelfth per month. I did more of a, a graph. Now, expenses look more linear than revenue because it doesn't have the bumps that the revenue does because of the property tax payments being in. April and June, so um, it looks pretty, pretty standard. Um, expenses for January: three hundred eighty-five thousand five seventy-one. Um, adjusted for billing amounts to Inner Canyon of fifteen thousand um, against a budget of four hundred seven one hundred eight. So again, we had good news in the month of January for expenses. Um, Things that came in under forecast, labor, administration, training, prevention, maintenance, fire stations, all came in under forecast. We had one capital purchase for 37000 I believe, and five fifty. I think that was, I believe, the, the truck for Captain Yellen. Correct. A pretty red truck. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, so... Net income for January was a negative, 297,126. This is pretty typical of January, February, March before property taxes are actually due. So not a surprise, pretty much commensurate with January of 2022. No surprise. Next slide. Property tax revenue, as we discussed, is uh, about 67% of our revenue. Again, this is a monthly picture, monthly graph of property tax, and you can see the big jumps in the months that property taxes are due. For the first month, we have uh, 3,494. We had a budget of $87. So, hey, we beat the budget in <laughs> January. Super. Year to date forecast for property tax revenue is 3,625,336. If anybody remembers last year, we came in very, very, very close to our forecast. So everybody cross their fingers, say a little prayer. Next slide. Okay, labor is the biggest part of the expenses for the fire department, which is certainly understandable. Um, this, again, this is monthly. When we get to like reporting for January, February, March, I'm probably going to show year-to-date numbers and year-to-date trend. There's not much of a trend when you just see one month. But if you look at labor adjusted for the build amounts to Inner Canyon, uh, we bill 50% of fuel services, prevention services 50%, I'm sorry, fuel services 100%, prevention services 50%, and maintenance 50%. So when it's adjusted for those billings, the year-to-date forecast is 2862125 that's about 53, a little over 53% of our total expense budget. It looks a little weird. Um, I used last year's spread, if you will, to do this year's monthly spread. I think again, as we see months come through and I show you the year to date type forecast, it'll look a little bit better. The monthly forecast tends to jump around a little bit. And um, I think it's November of 2022 that a lot of people took paid for personal time off as opposed to yeah. 
the cash yeah, out. Yeah, the PTO cash like out. We PTO usually do it in that out. November pay period. Okay. And that, that's, I think, part of that jump right there. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Again, this is labor adjusted for billings to Inner Canyon and no surf expense. And truthfully, in January, as would normally be expected, surf expense was zero. So some of these numbers are the same as the numbers on the previous slide. Forecast is a little different because, again, this is labor without surf and including adjustments. If anyone has any questions, just holler. Um, still positive variance for expenses, including labor. Next slide. <clears throat> surf. I love this slide, <laughs> this monthly slide, because you can actually see fire season, right? In other words, surf expenses are zero right now. Forecast was about uh, 4000 I think, because we actually had some expenses in January of last year. But you can actually see when fire season starts and when it goes down. Again, we'll start looking at your date probably about March. Uh, surf labor year-to-date forecast is $540,142. Some sense in there, too, but I didn't include them. Um, next slide. All right. This slide, if anybody remembers it from last year, it was very, very cluttered. The reason it's not cluttered now is the only thing that I'm showing is the submitted um, surf that we've received from the state for out of district attention to fires um, is the only thing that's on here. We have now received $1,271,439 for surf. So we received everything that we submitted, which is a good thing. And we received it in January as opposed to Last year, it was like March, April, before we got all of our money. So kudos to the people that do that. If anybody is interested, last year, there were 12 states that we went to for out of district. Texas was the biggest one. Um, it started earlier than some of the others. It was 43% of the total submitted, followed by New Mexico, Idaho, Alaska, Washington State, Oregon, Nebraska, Colorado was number eight. Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Wyoming. Any questions? Next slide. Any questions? No? <clears throat> Next slide. I'd like a motion to approve the expenses that were recorded in the ledger of $400,671. Please. That's what the amount was in the packet. Motion to approve the January financials of four hundred thousand six hundred and seventy dollars. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Chief, you're up. All right. <clears throat> so my report's a little shorter because we uh, we don't have a separate abbreviated wildland division report. They're going to do their annual report for last year. Uh, 2023 starts. We finished 2022. We finally reconciled all the calls. 1,415 calls for service. It's an increase of uh, 129 incidents over 2021, which finished with 1286. North Fork, Inner Canyon, and Elk Creek are continuing to work together on a number of projects, including some grants, some administrative alignment, as well as forming an engine, commit an engine design committee with members from all three of the agencies. The goal is to create a functional cost-effective design for a new engine with the goal of ordering a unit by 2024. Currently, our frontline Type 1 engines are a 1998, a 2004, and a 2014. And that's going to be, we'll talk about that quite a bit more at the strategic planning mm -hmm. meeting. Makes um, sense. Then uh, we, we are, this is grant season. We're elbows deep in a lot of grants. We've got... Uh, we are working on a grant with the state for wildland PPE. We're also working on another straight grant for a match for the ambulance to replace the 2009 unit. And something we just, it, we we're working on this afternoon, it'll be submitted tomorrow. We're getting a joint grant with uh, Platte Canyon Fire to do some radio replacement. Uh, our radios have been a challenge since we got them. Um, we've, we replaced them with what the industry standard was going to be. This, Bennings King, whatever, it's all minutiae, you don't need to know that. 
The, the important part is the, the last round of radios we bought, we had a 50% failure rate. And these aren't cheap, they're about $2,200 a piece. 50% of them failed. Mine failed, I turned it off, and I tried to turn it back on, and it just wouldn't turn back on. Inner Canyon had a 70% failure rate, so we were doing better than they were. But we have to do something. Um, there, we, we did get a demo of that same vendor, their new radio, and Captain Weinfeld has had it, and over the course of, I think, two days, uh, knob has fallen off, the lapel mic is falling off, and several other things. So we may not be going with this vendor again. <laughs> oh um, so Platte Canyon, we, we were talking to Chief Mulligan, and he's having the same experience with the same vendor. It's a standard of the wildland industry. And we're going to look at Motorola radios. Unfortunately, they are the most expensive radios out there, but there's a reason for that. So we decided to get together on this grant, and we're going to go for a significant capital improvement grant. We do have in the budget, we did budget a lot for comms because we have to buy radios because the other ones are not great. We just have to buy more of them. So we'll know about that. It's going to be the AFG grant. Um, I'll probably be working on that tomorrow with Chief Mulligan, but that'll be a TBD if we get that, fingers crossed. Uh, we have had, uh, it's been a relatively busy month, not for calls, but for acuity. We did have five fires this, uh, in January, and then we've had a couple this month as well. Uh, volunteer staffing, we had 300, 371 hours of staffing. We were actually up with average per call to 3.8 members per call, and 29% of the calls overlapped, and our average response time was 10.55. reason that's up a little bit is we finally hit winter, and obviously it's going to slow down with all the winter. Weather, you know, driving, we've been stuck in a number of driveways. We've already started racking up tow bills from getting stuck, so, you know, winter's here. One thing I did want to talk about on the call front, we did have a, uh, a structure fire over off of Dawson, and I did want to give a shout out to C-Shift. That would have been the acting officer, uh, Hartley, who's floating around here somewhere. She was the officer there. Bethany Irving, Chris Moy, they did an amazing stop. Um, along with Platte Canyon, we had two engine companies on scene, and from the time of arrival to the time the fire was knocked down was 17 minutes. Wow. Which is not bad for well below NFPA recommended staffing. And total water usage was 1,350 gallons, and that was it. It was just very efficient, very good work by them. So, thanks, Harley. Good job. Um, then, uh, um, additional emergency incidents, uh, mutual aid, we did receive mutual aid nine times uh, for the month, and transports, were, we had 38 transports. So that's trending about right, we had 65 EMS runs and 38 transports out of that. 304 hours of training, um, our area coordinators are working together to get the training schedule built out for the year, and this year we're planning on doing a lot more training with Inner Canyon and North Fork. Uh, on Thursday nights, they're Inner Canyon training. So right now, Wednesday nights are our trainings. Thursday nights are Inner Canyon. And so our people have several chances to get drill in now, which has been one of the critics, criticisms. If you're busy on Wednesday night, how do you make it? Now we're doing a lot more with Inner Canyon, which is Thursday night. So that's working out really well. Uh, fire prevention, Fire Marshal Parker has uh, completed 26 inspections for the month of December. And the application period for the Deputy Fire Marshal has, is closed this week. And we do have a decent pool of applicants. It's actually attracted some pretty good people, which is pretty exciting. Um, it's, it's a tough hiring market, as everybody knows right now. Um, there are actually fire departments offering signing bonuses, believe it or not. Um, but we're getting lucky. Fleet facilities, uh, the recent structure fires and the sub-zero temperatures, you know, negative 15 is not great for pouring water everywhere. We did have some freezing issues, as we always do every year. So we do have one engine down right now. The parts are on order. They came in today, and uh, Adam should have all that repaired by tomorrow afternoon or first thing Monday. Um, we've also had some garage floor motor failures, and then uh, we're trying to do some insulating and trying to uh, save some money on heating because our heating bills have been, uh, like everybody's, a little bit more. Um, yeah, that was all we had. Uh, the last bit about fleet facilities, we are still trying to figure out some security issues. January, we had somebody drive up to the station and make sure that our uh, fleet maintenance truck was locked. At about one in the morning, we have him on the camera. Guy drove up in the lights, got out of his truck, walked around, make sure all the compartments were locked, probably just because he was helping us out. And uh, <laughs> then uh, some of the guys upstairs heard him, turned on all the upstairs lights, and then he got in his truck and raced off with his headlights off. 
I don't know what to do about it. I mean, obviously lights and video cameras, it didn't do anything because everything was locked, but you know, now we have the lights, now we have video cameras, and we're still, we haven't had fuel stolen, so I guess that's a plus. Yes. Sign of the times. Yeah. Um, do you want to comment on the Jeffcom? Do you want to say anything? Or? Uh, Director Pixley, did you want to address that? Or? I don't know who made the notes. So. I did. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I can talk to this. So um, on uh, <clears throat> the 26th of last month, uh, the chief set up for Director Pixley and I a, a tour of uh, Jeffcom. Um, it was just the goal was to, you know, just to get a little bit better understanding of what they do uh, for us and uh, get a tour of the facility. And um, I was really, uh, we were met by uh, uh, Executive Director Streeter and then Deputy Director um, uh, uh, my, yeah, Michael Brewer, and then also um, one of the uh, duty supervisors, uh, Shane Palmer. And, uh, you know, they gave us a broad overview. Uh, we were just overwhelmed, blown away with uh, the technology, mm -hmm. the, the staffing, the, the knowledge, and, and really the job that they do there. It was, it was just fantastic. And very fortuitously, we were about to wrap up our tour, and we got a call in, an alarm call in, at the come and go down on uh, uh, Kings Valley. And uh, just in real time, we, we got a real time demonstration of exactly how the system works. Uh, Shane worked at three screens. He was identifying, uh, you know, over the radio and text and uh, all of the modes of communication he had there uh, in real time where the water resources in case it was a, you know, a, a real call. I, I, I don't know what the uh, status turned out to be, whether it's a false alarm. Or, I believe it was a false alarm. Uh, yeah, but uh, we were quite, uh, both of us were quite impressed. So uh, anybody that gets a chance to take a tour down there, I'd recommend it. Thank you. Oh. Chuck, did you want to mention anything about the uh, benefit that Chief Ware had gone or, or had created for the radio communications? I'm at a loss here on Zoom, but I think you'd be able to articulate how important it is what the Chief went through to create that yeah. radio system for uh, us. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, while we were there, uh, Deputy Director Brewer mentioned that you and Chief Weegee and I think Chief Sherlock yeah. were instrumental in creating a designing, implementing, fielding, testing a radio communication system early on Correct. Uh, for the mountain, uh, mountain community. And that turned out to be very instrumental in uh, the way uh, Jeffcom communicates to the mountain area even mm -hmm. today. So, in full disclosure, a lot of that was Chief McLaughlin. I kind of came in on the tail end of it, but yeah, that's a uh, uh, Chief Ouija, Chief Sherlaw, Chief Rogers. All of it. it's the JC Mars. When you see JC Mars on some of those invoices, it's the Jefferson County Mountain Area Radio System. So, you know, we had a ten thousand dollar. That was that random ten thousand dollar bill. We all pay into it. We have a shared expense on it because we have shared repeaters and yada 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 so yeah that's what right. I, that is it's, so <clears throat> they were very complimentary to you and the work that um, that, that team did and uh, they use it every day they say it's great well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad we signed the bill for it then today so. yes yes that's good I, thank you <laughs> all right anything else no that's it Old business. Uh, I'll take up the outreach committee update. Um, mostly, I just want to update you that the new website will launch on February 21. Um, we're not anticipating any other issues, but it was just a matter of there's a bunch of people trying to get these <clears throat> websites up and running, and we're in the queue and we have everything we need to get there. But so the 21st will be a launch. 
Um, there is, uh, I guess, the shredding program will go up on the other website or on another place, but that actually kicks off on the 20th. So, unfortunately, a little bit of off timing, but the 21st, we should see the, the good new website and we'll go from there. So, that's. You mean the chipping program? Chipping, sorry. What did I call it? Shredding? shredding. Sorry. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. It's a document shredder. Chippy, sorry. So, when is this, just out of curiosity, when does the sign up for that start? The 20th. I believe it's the 20th. Is that okay. it, Kev? Yeah, we have pushed out to do that. Yeah, I think everything, we've, I've already seen yeah. several emails about it. I just don't want to miss it, sure. <laughs> Stay up late. Okay, uh, consolidation committee update. Uh, there's no, unless you have some, there's nothing much to update because we approved the contract with Turncore yep. to move forward with the community education, and that's what it is, despite what some things came out as. It is an education. They're going to talk about the pros and the cons of consolidation because we want people to have the information that they need when they go to vote. Great. Mr. Di Director Pixley, do you have anything else to add? Or to? No, I, I think that uh, the conversations that we've had amongst the three districts has really been positive, and we, we are moving in the right direction now with the um, approval of, that we create that we had last month in terms of the uh, Turncore Magellan process. So thanks to the chiefs that are keeping us on track, and then all of the other dis the two other districts that are helping in ensure that we have communication and collaboration as we go through this process. I think our next meeting is the fourteenth of February, if I'm not mistaken, because I think I. Been volunteered to bring candy. Excellent. I know. <laughs> They'll be good. All right. Gentlemen, it's your show. <clears throat> and everything I'm about to show on the screen is in the handouts. For the show. And we'll put it up on our website as well. Um, real quick, the annual report. We've kind of done abbreviated annual reports before. They haven't really been this, the depth and the breadth hasn't been there yet. We, we want to get back to this next month in the interest of everybody's time. We're going to do the wildland division one this month. Next month, we'll do the full fire department annual report. Uh, obviously, that one has a few more pages. And like I said, in the interest of time, we're, we're going to kind of split it up. Good. So I'm going to sit here and not get in everybody's way, um, and Jason likes to walk around. It'll be a dynamic presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> really appreciate the time um, for us to present today. A lot of people that have put a lot of work into this year for the services that we provide are here also, so it's nice to recognize a lot of their hard work as well. Um, on that first page, it's really just a summary of all of the operations that we've done um, to frame the presentation tonight. Uh, what we strive for is to follow the national cohesive fire strategy within the wildland division. And so that is safe and effective fire response, fire adapted communities, and landscape scale restoration work. We have a lot of partners within that, but this is basically a presentation of what we strive for for that year. Um, we always sit down at the beginning of the year and try and figure out what our goals are for the year. We do have um, five-year plans within this, but this year we wanted to reinforce and grow our existing programs, continue to progress on a lot of the fuels treatments that you guys have been um, informed about um, throughout the years. Um, really add wildfire response quali qualifications and capabilities, and I think we've done a really good job of that this year, um, and build that strong, cohesive team. A lot of that has to do with everybody at Station 2, um, and we'll just continue to move forward uh, as best we can. All right, so for anyone who doesn't know me, Jason Mathequist, Module Appeals Officer. 
Um, before we go any further, I didn't want to point out we got a lot of family here from the folks who work in the wildland division. So all the stuff that we're talking about here and all the work those guys are doing on the ground, uh, there's some folks here that, that support them from the back end. So welcome to everybody who came. Some folks came from all the way in Oregon. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right, so community shipping program. Uh, we don't get a lot of opportunities to speak directly to our programs, to you and to the citizens and the folks who are supporting and enabling everything that we're able to do. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of what the folks accomplished this season and then what the community's feedback was on that. 2022 season had its fair share of challenges like it does every season. The chipping program is kind of like riding a roller coaster throughout the year because it's, it's a, a challenging program to administer. But with that being said, Ben Moses, who worked pretty hard on this report, uh, and the fuel screw folks, and then some help from the module, they were able to complete 480 uh, requests throughout the season. Uh, and I would say there was a bit of a, a shift in how the requests were looking um, this season versus some previous years because of some parameters and guidelines we put on the program to make it manageable. Uh, Folks were maxing out the amount of piles that they could put out. Um, so the irony was we've we found ways to try and make the program manageable, to try and keep it from uh, being as out of control as it has been in the past. And then uh, there was a ramp up in the amount of slash, which is great because it's hazard fuel reduction for the communities, but it was also reflected in the number of uh, cubic yards of biomass chip material that was removed. And, uh, presented some of those challenges throughout the season as well with keeping up with the demand for that. So uh, 900 cubic yards of chip material, and then the total piles chipped that they loaded into the chipper was 3,575 piles. Uh, so significant amount of material. I think it's a good reflection on the communities taking advantage of the program. It's a good reflection on the priorities of uh, the property owners within the communities. Uh, and I know that it was something that, like, around August or September, having conversations with Moses of, like, you know, what's, what's, what's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? And it was people are using every bit that they can within the restrictions that we put them in. So that's great. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a good sign for the program. Uh, 165 total hours, uh, chipper hours. Uh, and that kind of sums up uh, that program throughout the year. There was 1,858. Uh, personnel hours committed to the shipping program. Uh, program feedback. After the season and after the shipping program was wrapped up, uh, Ben sent out a, a survey to everybody who participated in the shipping program and asked them if they'd be able to lend their feedback and say what they thought of it. Uh, there was some uh, suggestions that I'll go over, but uh, overall, uh, about 95% of the respondents uh, reported uh, either good to excellent as far as how the service was for them uh, and there was some area for improvement as there is every single year that I've operated the program. We're going the seventh year and there's always room for improvement and it probably will never be perfect but with 95% of folks saying they were satisfied uh, we were happy with that. Another question they were asked was would you use the chipping program again? 98% of them approximately said that they would uh, which is again good for us removing those that biomass and those hazard fuels and for the community to continue to participate in the chipping program even with as as popular and sometimes hard as it is to get into that program it's good to see people are still wanting to use it. Uh, some of the most common homeowner suggestions that were returned with that survey as well was uh, detailed schedule and of service dates and times more frequent communication through email and more cleanup after chipping operations are finished. Each of those things I could talk on, uh, but I won't. We take those suggestions uh, and then we, we plan for the next season to try and look how we can improve those services for folks. Um, it, but every one of those has challenges associated with them. That's one of the reasons that they come back as areas for improvement. Uh, biomass. One of the largest challenges we have with the chipping program is getting rid of the material. We started the program with uh, just a pickup truck and a chipper seven years ago, and then we added a, a dumping capability with that amount of biomass, um, it's a challenge to get rid of, and it's a challenge to get rid of all along the front range. Um, the state forest service has specific grants to try and have, in you know, innovative ways of getting rid of the material. Our our material is not sellable, basically. 
And so nobody wants it, so we have to find ways of getting rid of it. Um, the worst case scenario is we drive all the way down the hill to A1 Organics with about a two hour turnaround time. So um, our partners come into play quite heavily. Um, this year, um, Jefferson County Open Space helped us out quite a bit. John Mandel helped to facilitate that at Inner Canyon. Um, and we were able to actually dump at that wagon wheel site um, free of charge and they take our material and they bring it down because they do operate the slash program as well. So now they're taking our biomass, including into the slash program. So we can be a little bit more efficient um, within all of our other programs and all of our other work. It has been an incredibly huge help um, to us on a daily basis. So um, yeah, you can see that pine um, is, a, is a big area that we do dump, but um, wagon wheel was, was a big help to us. Did you figure out which group one was? Uh, <clears throat> group one, I believe, is the, wood, is, is the uh, western side of the district in the Woodside area. Okay. Um, and they're always pretty high performers. Uh, so group one took the cake this, this year as far as um, the most amount of material that was moved. All right, so uh, I think it's important to shine a light on uh, the various services that the Wildland Division offers. And this report, I think, does a pretty good job of painting that. And one of the big ones is soft projects. Shipping programs, one of them, the soft projects uh, take a considerable amount of time as well. Uh, right now, we've got a number of them. One of them that we worked on last season uh, primarily was the Glen Elk Fuel Break and Defensible Space. Uh, the crews did 25 and a half acres of thinning, uh, ridge top thinning for a shaded fuel break uh, on Glen Elk. Uh, that was completed last year. Uh, the ridge is done. Uh, and now there's a second phase of that project, which is focused on defensible space around houses and historic cabins in the Glen Elk area. And that's where, the, that's where we're working right now um, this, this winter. Uh, Douglas Ranch, we've done work for Douglas Ranch since 2018, uh, when some of the community members uh, reached out to us and wanted to have a project done there. Uh, we're working on a new phase there that we've already started cutting on. It's an additional six acres. The six acres for the Douglas Ranch project are actually in the same proximity uh, of Glen Elk, and it's another shaded fuel break on a ridge top that can be used operationally in the event of a wildfire. And the two of those are kind of complementing, and both of them are protective fuel breaks around two separate communities that are neighbors. So they, peg, they, they ping off each other really well, um, and we've been able to get continuous progress as we uh, sort of complete and then approve phases uh, and move to that project. Uh, Samson is a project that we're working in the planning phases right now. Um, Captain Mandel from Inner Canyon has helped with planning this project. It highlights another important uh, objective for the Wildland Division. We've got, I've talked about shaded fuel breaks, hazard fuel reduction, and defensible space around houses. Uh, another one of them is life safety and evacuations. Uh, if you're a student of destructive wildfires in the last few years, you know that how hazardous those can be. Uh, so the Samson is actually a uh, new road construction for evacuation routes that facilitates some of the homeowners who uh, have the worst evacuation and worst roads uh, pretty much anywhere in the mountain area. Um, there's a couple of exceptions that are probably worse, but in the event of wildfire, they're going to be in a bad spot. So Samson's one that we're going to be working on moving forward. Right now it's in the planning phases, and Captain Mandel has been outlining that and working with private <coughs> stakeholders who are actually really spearheading that project. We're just going to be implementing and helping them. Uh, the Preserve of Pine Meadows, we're working on another phase for them as well. We did uh, a little over 40 acres of juniper eradication and thinning for them that was completed in 2021. Uh, we've been able to work another phase with them that's also an evacuation route, life safety, uh, uh, prioritized project that's supposed to be doing roadside thinning for a one-way in, one-way out evacuation, uh, similar to Samson. In 2022, the total project hours committed to cuts was 2,085. Uh, and that was represented a pretty significant amount of where the modules time went. Um, the fuels crew um, has objectives to help with these things as well. They were pretty well buried with the, the chipping program last season. So, uh, but we're going to see over the next season, uh, we're going to be juggling some projects around. We're going to be working hard on both the chipping and the cutting. Uh, pile burning. Many of these projects are designed uh, with uh, pile construction and then burning is the easiest way to get rid of the fuels, especially when there's a 20-30 minute hike in to the cutting area and you don't have the option of removing the material. 
so the Boxton project was one that we completed cutting on in 2021. Uh, and then those piles were cured over so some uh, winter seasons, and then we went out there and we burned them. We completed the Foxton project. That was a 48-acre 48 48 acre project. All of the piles that we stacked had been burned. So that one's completed from cut to burn. Uh, preserved pine meadows, we've got those 40-plus acres uh, with many piles out there that we're going to be working on over the next couple of winters. And then Glen Elk, the ridge top, has got a lot of piles on it from where we cut that defensible uh, uh, shaded fuel break, and we've actually been able to get out there this winter and start burning on that. I'm anticipating just a handful of days to be able to complete uh, the whole ridge top up there. So we're seeing really good progress. 347 total hours committed to pile burns for the uh, 2022 year, and most of that was reflected last spring, although we are moving with springtime burns for this year right now. So other programs to be aware of, um, and we've moved forward with with some unexpected opportunities as well. So fuel sampling, um, Chief has supported um, buying some equipment. So we're able to now take our own fuel samples um, across the area. We have designated sites in, in order to be able to take fuel, fuel um, moisture samples. What that does um, along a, a fair amount of math is it allows us to figure out what we need to do for staffing levels, where we might want to concentrate some resources now that we are supporting a larger district um, and really help with some fire behavior predictions um, in the event of a wildfire. So that is a, a very uh, helpful tool, especially before the fire, for us to be able to predict, predict what is exactly going on. Because as you guys know, we go from right around 5,000 feet all the way to 10,000 feet. Fire behavior isn't necessarily going to be the same across those fuel sampling areas. The mastication projects is also down uh, Sampson Road, um, where we've implemented that thanks to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office at no cost to us. Um, they've provided that entire mastication setup. And so, work again, working with our partners, um, as, as John can attest, cutting is not the tool in a lot of inner canyons, uh, neck of the woods, oak brush, like scroll back and it gets very dense. So mastication and heavy equipment is the tool. Um, it was a pilot project this year. We got the agreement that took a little while, figuring out how the, how the machines work, the training for safety and everything was a, was a big part of that. Um, as you can see, the program for the, the fuel sampling, sorry for skipping over that, it did take about 215 hours to set up, but it is, um, at the point of implementation. So it took a lot of hours to actually facilitate uh, building the program, but they've done an incredible job and we've actually partnered with uh, the US Forest Service to verify all of, of what we're doing. And I would add that with the, the fuel sampling program, Ben Moses and the fuels folks worked pretty hard on that. Um, and then eventually after they felt comfortable with it, they went and, and spoke with folks from the US Forest Service. Um, and they were pretty blown away with what Ben had built. Um, so I think that's worth noting. Uh, in fact, he told them that he was probably running a little stricter than he had to to keep uh, data um, consistent. So, uh, all right, so all hazard, this kind of uh, comes over some of the emergency response things that we do. Uh, there was a number of all hazard incidents that the, the crews responded to. Uh, they're kind of specialty, they're outdoor cats, so they help with outdoor things. Uh, and it was special when we could provide manpower. So uh, they helped setting up landing zones for uh, helicopters, uh, with backcountry rescues, and extricating people out of parks. Uh, and there was a number of uh, medical calls, lift assists, and, and things like that that they assisted with throughout the year as well. Uh, fires, go back. Fire suppression. Uh, there was a number of in-district fires throughout the, uh, the year. Uh, over the fire season, we luckily had a slower fire season. There was two initial attacks the fuels crew worked on, uh, but over last spring, everybody probably already knows there was a number of fires that uh, were popping up here and there that uh, the resources helped with as well. Uh, and then backcountry rescues, like I said, uh, there was a number of those that the crews assisted with uh, as needed. Okay, out of fire, out of district fire assignments. Um, everyone knows the module goes available throughout the fire season to assist nationally. There's a number of reasons that. Uh, we support that, and that's one of the operations uh, and services that we provide. Uh, this last season, uh, moderately busy. It wasn't a super busy fire season, 
Uh, but Texas was experiencing some of the most historic droughts that they've seen in a long time. Um, so the module spent 28 days in Texas, two assignments. One of those was as a module, one of them was paired with a partner, U.S. Forest Service crew that we uh, partnered up with out of Utah, and we went as a 20-person hand crew uh, for a number of reasons that benefit both crews. Um, I would tell you that while we were there, some of the temperatures they were seeing was 116 degrees with uh, you know 80% outages. So it was pretty miserable, but fires were burning a lot. All the flags on the map represent fires that the crew responded to, and there was periods when we were down there that uh, we were the only anchor in the state of Texas, so we were busy. Uh, I think we put on hours and hours and hours of drive time as we bounced from fire to fire. Uh, after that, uh, the last assignment of the season was to Idaho. Uh, the crews helped with the Four Corners fire, uh, which was outside of Cascade, Idaho, and then took over a fire that was on the Emmett Ranger District, um, south of Cascade. And uh, the uh, words from the district uh, ranger there, it was the fire that they didn't want, when they didn't want it, where they didn't want it. He was concerned it would be at a, a Four Corners fire on the other side of Cascade, mm -hmm. and the crew was able to keep it at 12 acres. Uh, very logistically challenging fire. The guys did a great job. Uh, and then a number of fires in Colorado. The big takeaway from all of this uh, is training experience, and we walked away from this last season with an additional ICT-4, Incident Commander Type 4, uh, a qualified incident commander type 5, one of our squad bosses, Lucas Connect, he was able to finish that in Texas. Uh, an additional firefighter type 1, two faller 2s, which is chainsaw qualifications, uh, heavy equipment boss, Billy Gage, the assistant for the module, and then Billy also finished his crew boss for the season, and then a fire effects monitor, which is someone who uh, helps monitor the effects of fires on the, on the landscape. So that's a lot of qualifications to add for a season, and I think it reflects particularly all of the training opportunities in Texas because they were so swamped that they were just throwing the crew at everything and saying it's yours. We don't have anybody to deal with it. So, so with the wildfire prepared program, uh, we were able to do about 152 assessments and that's uh, Kelly McConaughey right back there. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, it can take up to about four hours and she's marking a lot of trees these days. Uh, which is fantastic. Um, she's doing a great job with that program. Um, we do send surveys out uh, to see what people are doing because we give them about a 26-page work plan. Um, Kelly sometimes isn't invited back <laughs> because of the, all of the amount of work that she's giving these homeowners. But um, all the reviews that we're getting is it's a, a very um, desired program. 100% of our homeowners who responded to the service have done something after Kelly's been there. Um, and if you look on the, the pie chart to the left, um, almost 54% have spent more than 21 hours actually implementing what she's done within a year. So um, while it's a certificate program, um, it is not a small task for homeowners to get to. So um, one certificate issued within the year is not that... Um, impressive if you would say but the amount of work of people working towards there is a lot of the retrofits in the buildings that we have up here are going to take time and they are going to be expensive kelly's basically telling people to replace roofs and siding and decks so uh, when the cost gets into the fifty thousand range um, it takes a little bit of time so we have we have a lot of things to work towards in the structure hardening in the area so um, and then you can see the percentages of the recommendations completed. Um, there is a, the structure hardening and then the defensible space aspect. There is that educational component that we do in terms of evacuations and everything along with those assessments. Um, it's not operational, but I did want to take the time to recognize the ambassador program as well. Right now we have 31 planning units represented by 36 ambassadors, three of them are, which are sitting right here. Um, and that has been a great program. We're integrating that more and more into all of our other operations within this. Um, and at the same time, uh, just wanted to say that Al is coming with Captain Manlow and I down to Boulder for a national um, training on how to put Recording on Recording in progress. Program. And there are people coming from the nation to listen to us on how we've done our ambassador program here. So um, that's that's kudos to John, that's kudos to Al, that's kudos to all our ambassadors. Yeah. Oh. 
something happened with. Yeah, they cut out. That's hard to believe. <clears throat> Uh, so the last uh, bit of information, the only thing that I really would call attention to, this is a, just a, a bunch of numbers that summarize uh, some of the things the crews did. Um, 4,293 and a half hours spent on project. Um, personnel hours with four initial attacks of district. Thankfully, low seat, low uh, uh, slower season uh, for the year with the crews, but uh, they were able to take advantage of that, leverage it, and put in a lot of time on uh, project. I would say looking forward, we're, project, we're looking to be able to tie up uh, a lot of projects we're working on now. Uh, and I always put my, my piece in with the board of thanking everyone for the support and the citizens. Uh, all the work from, from me from the implementation point and, and uh, my folks that are on the ground, all the work that they're able to do is because of the board and the citizens. Um, and I think this last year was pretty successful uh, with all those things. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate it. That's all I got. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. This is very, very well done and very helpful. Ben Moses, he's become a madman with making things like that, and he's doing a great job. So. Yeah, you don't get to use them for your report. Sorry, that's what? that's yeah, that's that's <laughs> theirs. <laughs> Do you like them? No, I'm kidding. All right. Um, we are to the point where we. Uh, have the honor of swearing in and badging some new members. And is Greg Pixley back? Is he still on? Are you still up, Pix? Yes, I am. Perfect. Uh, real quick, so we we kind of got away from this uh, a number of years ago, swearing in our career firefighters and our volunteer firefighters. I was trying to bring that back, and then there was that little thing that happened in 2020 where we could do literally anything. Um, and so now we're trying to catch up on that. Uh, we have historically, once somebody completes a rookie year, they're sworn in as a firefighter, a full member with Del Creek Fire. Uh, the individuals we have here tonight um, have uh, all arrived here through various random phone calls, and they just kind of showed up, and everybody's excelled. Um, we've got uh, most of the leadership in the uh, module, they're, uh, and, and the uh, chipping crew, or the fuels crew. They, uh, they, they all ended up here. Uh, Billy actually called one day because he saw the job for Captain Yellen's job and thought he was gonna apply for it. And then I said, talk to Pat, there might be another job. And that was how many years ago? Mm, one of five. Five? Yeah, totally random. <laughs> and then uh, same thing, uh, Luke and Ale and started here seasonals. And they have now promoted to squad leaders, and they're full-time permanent employees as well. And Hunter started out on the module and shifted over to the uh, fuels crew, and he's a permanent as well. So, Pix, do you have do you have good enough internet to? Yes, I I do, and uh, I apologize for not being there. This is one of the most important things that we as a board can do, and if you all will allow me. Uh, this honor, I, I really am taken by these type of events, as I believe my fellow board members are as well. And I had said something that is, I believe, impressionable, and it means a lot to me at a previous swearing-in ceremony that I think holds true anytime we have firefighters that are willing to step up and serve their community, provide emergency service, put their lives at risk, while at the same time doing something that other people do not have the capability or the desire to do. And what I had said is that there are three benchmarks in a firefighter's career that they never forget. Probably the coup de grace of all of them is what's happening tonight. But the retirement of a firefighter going through their career as they are moving on, that's something that will last uh, in, in their mind. That is an important piece as they performed a lifelong service to the community. But before that, the thing that is also as impressionable is any time that a firefighter is promoted or uh, completes a certification as they progress through the ranks, to increase their capabilities to be able to provide that emergency service. 
and to not only increase their safety, but also provide for their family. But none of those, either of those two things, have any relevance whatsoever unless they go through what our firefighters are going through tonight. And that is being pinned, becoming a part of this fire department. This is the, the time being sworn that a new firefighter would not have the opportunity for those, those former events without becoming a firefighter. And we as a board are so proud of our new firefighters that are being sworn in today. And we certainly appreciate the fact that we have family members present, present some who traveled uh, all the way from Cali, I understand. And that shows the significance of this type of event. So thank you for letting me uh, speak. And I, uh, again, congratulate you as we go through this. And Chief, I'll let you take it from here. But I can't wait to meet you all face to face and shake your hand. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, please. Please. All right, fellas. Stand up here. <laughs> Put you on camera. You can come over too. You can stand by there. It's like a family deal, you know? Alright. We ready? Alright, so you get to follow me in making the statements. I'll have you raise your right arm. And and then I'm going to say I, and then you say your name to all of you. So I, state your name, do solemnly swear to do my duty. I, AOCA, do solemnly swear, swear to do my duty. As a firefighter for the Elk Creek Fire Protection District to the best of my ability. As a firefighter for the Elk Creek Fire Protection District to the best of my ability. To serve my commanding officers with respect and dignity. To serve my commanding officers with respect and dignity. To serve the citizens of the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. To serve the citizens of the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. With compassion, courage, and integrity. With compassion, courage, and integrity. And to uphold the laws and constitution of the United States of America. And to uphold the laws and constitution of the United States of America. State of Colorado, the State of Colorado, and the Elk Creek Fire Protection District, and the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. So help me God. So help me God. And then the next step is sorry, firefighters are always pinned by a friend, family member, loved one somebody who has met a lot and led them to this point. So we'll start with, uh, who's one? Billy Gaby. Billy will be pinned by his family, his wife.
up is Hunter Petrie. Hunter actually is the one who came. He was seasonal on the uh, modules. And then left and tried to do a couple other things and realized that Wildland's actually way cooler than most other things. Came <laughs> back. Hunter will be pinned by Billy. Sir. But not Lee, Lucas, legally pinned by his mom and dad, who uh, actually came in from Oregon. How's the weather here compared to Oregon? Is it wet? <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> oh, you can stab it. <laughs> He's good at surviving. Don't hit him in the knee. Okay, well, leave him. several more of those just to catch up from the last couple of years, but uh, thank you everyone for being here. That's great. Thank you for joining the district. Um, last uh, issue on our agenda is citizens' uh, comments issues. Director Wagner, could I come post the uh, table and hand out some material? Sure, we can get them if you want to talk while you're... <coughs> Chief, did you have something on the surplus? Oh, shoot. We'll come right back to that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back. You go ahead and finish, then we'll come back. We'll catch back up. Well, tonight uh, I'd like to talk about uh, a uh, important issue that's going to uh, uh, potentially impact or uh, constructive to impact in a major way the uh, Oak Creek Fire Protection District. And it involves a uh, uh, project called the uh, Shadow Mountain Bike Park. And recently the uh, bike park submitted paperwork and printed out it's about two inches thick to the Jefferson County Planning and Zoning Department to begin the process of seeking an approval of a um, official development plan for that park, which is located about two miles up from 73 on Shadow Mountain Drive. And uh, right now the documents are in a uh, uh, process called sufficiency re review, where the staff of planning and zoning reviews them to see if they meet basic standards for acceptance. 
and then when it is sufficient, they will open the case up formally and uh, ask for the first referral, and these documents are all available on the uh, internet from PNC site right now. Um, so the purpose of my uh, talk is to alert the board to one of the key design failures of the proposed project, and it's a uh, basically a single entrance exit, uh, a cul-de-sac, and if you would open up that map, I provide you with a map, which is from the report, it's a drainage map, but it does, I thought it was about the best map that showed the extent of the project and the nature of the uh, single entrance on uh, Shadow Mountain Drive. And the, um, it shows the uh, main development area at the foot of the lift, which is about six acres of more or less complete uh, rebuild. And that has uh, 281 spaces, according to the uh, uh, applicant. And there will be the parking spaces, and there will be uh, 20 more spaces at the maintenance building, which is located a short distance away. And then the, uh, the applicant hopes to have, I keep talking about 300 spaces for parking, so it's a 320 uh, car parking lot. And I believe that two points are essential for uh, ingress and egress for uh, public safety, and that's what I would like to uh, uh, discuss. And, <clears throat> and Elk Creek will be receiving a first referral, so uh, I would hope that uh, Elk Creek will take seriously uh, uh, my comments here. And, and one reason why in particular, uh, in a uh, sort of immediate or semi-emergency uh, evacuation order of uh, Shadow Mountain Drive and all the tributary roads and potentially the bike park, I feel that uh, uh, everybody that gets that has a home up here and has a motor home uh, or a, uh, a trailer pulled by a vehicle or a horse trailer or a um, state trailer, uh, they're going to hook all that up and fill it with stuff and uh, llamas and horses and what have you. And if they think they're going to get burned out, well, we're going to take our motor home. We've got to live someplace. So uh, and I do feel that. Uh, these vehicles, in many cases, maybe not, maybe driven by people who have never driven them before, or don't quite know how to handle them. And uh, the uh, entrance there to that uh, bike park would be a, if they needed to turn around in case uh, Shadow Mountain Drive was closed or something, uh, would be a place to back in and try to turn around. And there's about a three, according to the uh, applicant, there's a three degree slope from Shadow Mountain Drive into the parking lot, so that yeah. might be a good spot to flip over a uh, horse trail yeah. drill with yeah. horses and block the uh, um, uh, evacuation from the facility. So uh, uh, I reviewed the Elk Creek Fire Protection District will serve letter, which was uh, sent off on uh, November the 14th, and it states that, uh, quote, the off-site fire apparatus access to the property is acceptable. The uh, letter is silent on if this single road is acceptable for egress under wildlife fire immediate evacuation conditions. And then I've provided you with a copy of the uh, Ember Alliance uh, Shadow Mountain Bike Park Wildfire Risk Assessment. There's no date on the report, but presumably around November the uh, uh, 2022. And it shows. Uh, on figure 11, the areas of non-survival roadways along Shadow Mountain Drive. On figure 15, they map the safe separation distance analysis and attached verbiage uh, states, quote, under extreme weather conditions, the safe separation distance would need to be up to 2,350 feet away from the parking lot which is approximately the distance to the top of the lift line, and then continuing, quote, and the average safe separation distance for the parking lot area is 1,100 feet. And in a discussion uh, titled Temporary Area of Refuge, which is figure 20, the main draw, uh, figures 23, the Ember Line states 
Under extreme weather conditions and current vegetation, the safe separation distance between people and fire would need to be up to 23, 50 feet away from the parking lot, again, which is approximately the distance from the parking lot to the top of the lift line. Okay. Understanding that it is not feasible to clear an area that large and that the Shadow Mountain Bike Park has no control over areas outside its boundary, we recommend clearing all trees in the base camp area, which is that area adjacent to the uh, parking lot and the lodge, uh, except Aspen and regularly removing any ladder fuels. Uh, continuing on in their discussion, if the area was flat and with no wind, 150 feet plane separation would be a quote safe distance. Then quoting, the area is not flat and there is expected to be wind during fire events. So Dudley, that safe zone would make a buffer of at least 300 feet around the parking lot. And in sort of conclusion, in view of the non-survivability segments on Shadow Mountain Drive and a recommended greatly reduced flame separation of 300 feet, which I don't quite understand how they could reduce it from 2350 to 300 feet, I suggest it would be mandatory to have two exit points for the facility. Indeed, in the first conceptual map released by Shadow Mountain Bike Park at the time of their first uh, planning and zoning required community meeting in January 2021, two entrances are shown in the northwest corner of their lease block. And the Ember Alliance in figures 12 and 14 includes these two outdated entrances apparently in error. So uh, there, initially there was proposed two entrances and somehow magically they shrunk to one. And so my conclusion is, the question is, will the Elk Creek Fire Protection District recommend a, a cul-de-sac design for two entrances for this proposed project and the first referral um, for, for this project? <clears throat> we'll have to discuss that with Fire Marshal Parker and see. I mean, that letter was written. I think the one that the the last one was in November, I believe. Yes, yeah, November the fourteenth, and it's not clear whether um, Fire Marshal had the Ember Alliance report. I, I was going to say we'll we'll have to we'll, we'll look into that. and We'll get back to you on that. Well, thank you. I appreciate the information and. Uh, raising an alert to us and something that will, it's not really for us, the board, necessarily to take that on because we're not the ones issuing the legal serves. But we'll uh, get the chief bring to the fire marshal parker's attention. Any other citizens' comments, issues? I'm a tag team with him on another issue associated with the same facility, oh. but if you want to do your business first. No, let's, we'll just wrap okay. this up. And we'll... I have a handout, too. <laughs> and I only included all the um, attachments as references. Yours, the other ones just have the references listed. The other thing that's concerning about the bike park for citizens group that has been working on this since January of 2021 is emergency medical service for downhill bike parks. Um, and this one may be of interest to the board too, but um, I'll go through it pretty quickly. I have a lot of numbers in here because there's been a lot of research, but um, my comments are to describe the impact uh, expected impact on, uh, of Shadow Mountain Bike Park on the emergency medical services. And the bottom line is the impact will potentially be significant. Um, there's a fair amount of research on injuries that exist with downhill bike parks. Um, I've included references and I show a lot of numbers in here. And the confusing part about the applicant's uh, submittal was they indicated 70 to 80,000 bikers per season. They indicated peak days of 750 bike riders, which would be 5,250 bikers a week. Um, they, their season's going to go 36 weeks. I, I just, after looking at all the data, decided 3,000 a week is probably reasonable, which is about 100,000 bikers a year. 
And that also helps us look at um, other bike parts that are that size, but the um, number of bike riders that are going to have severe injuries based on medical research is uh, about 16.8 severe injuries for every thousand hours of downhill mountain biking. So you can do the multiplication on that, but there's probably going to be uh, an ambulance going there every day or every other day uh, based on that. There's a, a bike park that did an extensive study on um, one season of 100,000 riders, they had 75 ambulance transports in just 147 days. Um, so if we sort of take those numbers, apply it to Elk Creek and what they're typically doing in that time, which is you know 30, 40 transports a month, um, that would be 138 transports for their uh, bike park season, which is a 51% increase in your ambulance service just to serve the bike park. So I think um, if the uh, district receives no impact monies in the form of a mill levy or the other funds from local or state government for this opera operation and the residents understand there's over a 50% increase in service, the district, um, I would believe, should extract some form of money from the developers or if remain silent, um, and provide the service at the best you can uh, based on your abilities, um, the taxpayers are going to notice because there's going to be a lot more service required for the kinds of injuries that happen with that many people screaming down a bike park um, on a lift, you know, up a lift and then down through the, um, through the woods. So, um, I guess we could convince the voters uh, to vote for a mill levy to cover the increase of 51% of ambulance services. Um, there's other things that can be done. I suggested a couple in here. I'm sure you can talk to other districts that have mountain bike parks. Uh, Winter Park is one. The year after they put their mountain bike park in, they put an emergency helicopter landing zone. So if that gives you any sense of what kind of injury rates you're going to see, there's going to be quite a few. Um, if nothing are, is really done, um, there's a, at least 2,000 residents of the Elk Creek District that have already signed a position opposing this park, <coughs> and many of them understand that there's going to be impact on EMS. So I just wanted to sort of alert you to this as this is developing, provide some references, there's a lot more. Um, a bunch of people racing down a mountain that are not experts um, break a lot of collarbones. So I suspect someone may, may want to think and talk to others about this, uh, maybe get a neutral contract that both the district and the uh, developers might agree to a neutral contractor in sports medicine that can say, hey, this is what to expect and what kinds of uh, expenses you're going to see increase so you can levy some sort of an agreement because I suspect, based on the research I've done, and we've actually got people that have talked to medical doctors on our team, that there's going to be a lot of injuries and the ambulance is going to be there a lot from March 1st till December 1st. And thank thank you. you for raising the issues. I appreciate it. We'll take them under advisement as we move forward. So, back to any other citizens comments. All right, then I'm going to bring us back, Chief, to the last new business issue, which is surplusing the C S C B A. And I apologize about that. I got. Uh, no, that was me. On this side, so. Yeah, I, I wanted to have board approval. Um, so, as you know, we were awarded a health and safety grant last year to replace our aging antiquated SCBAs. Mm -hmm. Our SCBAs were from 2008. While they're still functional, their recommended end of life was 10 years. Obviously, we got our money's worth out of them. Uh, once we received that grant, as well as um, <laughs> able to purchase more, we were able to replace our whole fleet. Um, our first set of SBAs were purchased via an AFG grant. One of the stipulations of the grant is you can't sell equipment that you purchased via the grant, which makes sense, obviously. I'd like to ask board approval to donate those SCBAs to another fire department. While 
they may not be ideal for us. There are a lot of fire departments that don't have anything. We've done this with bunker gear and a lot of other things. Um, they are functional. We get them tested every year. They're for a slower fire department. They'll work just fine. So, but I would like the board approval to donate them to another fire department. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to donate the SCBAs that we have. Got it right? Yes. The SCBAs that we have that are no longer in use by our fire department to donate those to another fire department. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No, I heard all eyes. Great. Perfect, and I'll have more information next month. I'm talking to a couple fire departments. Uh, we've got 45 of them. So if we split them up with a couple places, but we'll have letters and you'll know where they went. Great. It's great. It's a good thing to do with them. Final item on the uh, agenda is a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 For, uh, let's see, the Board of Directors meeting is adjourned at 7.20ish. <laughs> <laughs>